this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are taking a look at the 2021 college football season and breaking down the futures market with Drew Martin getting his thoughts on some win totals, conference odds, and the national championship to get you set for this year. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. And Ed, you have been the dedicated host for today. You have moved to a friend's house because your power is out. There is a cat joining you. It is awesome. I'm in a good mood because of this. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I've had better days. <laughs> um, um, yep, I've had better days, but you know what? You got to do what you got to do. I was going to do this on the internet on my phone, but it seems like everyone in Ann Arbor is using that network. So, uh, yeah, zero internet there, uh, zero internet from the landline and, uh, yeah, making do, do you try know to figure this out? Cats, do you know the cat's name? Cause we can get a, a, a uh, lower third I think up here somewhere. Coco or Jojo. I don't, I, I really don't know. Okay. Well, we have a third co-host also, for today. I, I also don't know if I can just... I can just push the cat off, right? Cats no, 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 just no. jump and the, fall and stuff like hold that. Hold the cat in your lap and make it a third co-host the entire time. I feel like that's the only way to do this here. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the cat likes me that much. The cat <laughs> certainly, it's hanging out with you. That's a good sign. Yeah, it's hanging out. It's hanging out. It's chilling. Yeah, yeah we're, got, we're just rolling with it. I've got my dog over here. She is exhausted from a 12-hour car ride from Chicago out oh, to... Yeah. Uh, Syracuse so we're just a pet friendly podcast you know I guess today. so I guess so so we are clearly at our best as we head into uh the month of August NFL preseason underway college football just around the corner of course breaking that down with Drew Martin in just a bit you can find him on Twitter at Drew Martin bets you of course know Drew from being on this podcast many a time but also via wager talk and sports per grid we're talking about is his process of been in the futures market in college football letting you know what keys you want to know before you make some bets, uh, what research you can do to try to optimize things and try to streamline things as well. We'll talk to Drew about that in just one second. But if you want some NFL talk, we do have a couple of podcasts posted. We talked to JJ Zacharyson two weeks ago on NFL player props, his uh, player projection, building process, all that stuff, and his favorite process this year. And also last week, we had Aaron Dolan on talking about the divisional outrights market. So plenty of stuff on the Covering the Spread podcast. You can find that by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast and while you are there make sure you leave a rating and review as well before we dive into the college football futures market though we got to go back and wrap up the olympics where ed uh, i think we need to make a pivot in what this podcast covers pretty regularly covering the past so we will get to the, the good side of the Olympics here in just one second. But first, we do want to close the book on uh, we had Drew Dinzik on to talk about metal count or uh, metal counts and things like that. And kind of wanted to bring this up because it's some rough luck for Drew. He had under 26 and a half gold medals for Japan. And it looked really good to start. He was talking about judo and how they needed to beast out there to get over 26 and a half. And their overall medal count was 58. But 27 of 58 were gold medals. And that could be due to home field advantage. You're talking about that being a thing. There could be an element of that in this. But it still feels like a tough beat, Ed, when you have 58 total medals, 27 of those, almost half are gold. Right. That just kind of feels like a bad beat. But the process overall is still quality there. Yeah. And the, the last gold was that baseball the very last day, right? Yeah. So, so it looked good for a very long time. Yeah. No, I was I kept looking at that and I actually thought he had 27 and a half or 28 uh at the number. So I thought I thought he was still good, but uh yeah, that that's a bummer. Bad beats happen. I yeah, think we're going to be talking might, about some he more. He might have gotten it before it dipped. When we talked it was 26 and a half. But I think right. he may have gotten it. So let's hope. Let's hope at least that yeah. Drew got a uh, 27 and a half. So that would be tremendous for him. Uh right. but if you got 26 and a half, that does feel like a bad beat with the way the medals were distributed for Japan. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely remember all that chatter the first day about, uh, yeah, the first night we yeah. were talking about how Japan missed on a bunch of golds that they should have gotten. But home field advantage, they they managed to figure it out. 
So clearly that uh, that one hopefully got the good number there on Japan with the gold medals, but they did wind up with 27. But Ed, on a happier note, uh, you were on Joshua Chiptegi. Is that how you say that? Chapter guy. Chepta guy, Chepta guy, uh, Joshua Chepta guy, a plus 430 to win the men's 5,000 meter, the Ugandan one. So, Ed, you had that. You also had the steeplechase win. Do we need to pivot to becoming a track and field podcast now? Uh, yeah, I would love that if, if John Cheeran <laughs> gives me the markets to, to talk about. <laughs> um, I would love to come up with some models. It was an interesting experience for me because I didn't have my typical analytics. It was more knowledge of the sport that i was going on um so yeah i would actually i would love to create some models and figure out what you know in races in which you have a lot of data like 1500 meters and and lower uh, i think you could do some really interesting things um we do need to talk i did talk about a couple losses as well so i did not get ry benjamin in the 400 meter hurdles uh, i did not get timothy chariot the favorite to win the 1500 meters but the two men that beat them Ran all time great. I talked about the those on the show, right? Uh, you talked about the Rye Benjamin one, I think, like maybe before the Olympics, and yeah. then we talked about the uh, Chariot one, like the first week. Okay, so yeah, so the uh, so those those didn't pan out, but they were all time Olympic performances to beat them. Uh, Rye Benjamin broke the world record by ha- over a half second. Just got bested by someone that had an even better day that day as well. And then uh, Jakob Ingebrigtsen beat Chariot. I thought uh, Chariot actually had the perfect strategy. He tried to do exactly what he did in the 2019 World Championships where he won by, I think, two seconds. Or He just obliterated the field. He tried to do that again. He ran the same time that he did again. Uh, but the 20-year-old from Norway just managed to peak perfectly. Um, and running 328 in an Olympic final in that heat is insane. It, it's unheard of. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. If you would have told me that before the Olympics, I really wouldn't have believed you, but that's what we saw in the 1500 meter final. Yeah. It was uh fun to watch for sure. And a lot of good individual performances at the Olympics for this year. Any final yeah. thoughts for you in general on the Olympics and, and betting it specifically that we learned from this year? I think I learned that, uh, I was kind of sad this week with no adrenaline first thing in the morning with these <laughs> finals happening, you know, it, it's just such a blessing to wake up at 7 a.m. Eastern time and, and get an Olympic uh, final. Um, I think overall, I think overall I did all right, but it obviously would have been a better if a couple of bets would have gone my way. I still think the process of liking runners that have done it consistently uh, over the last couple of years is still my way to go. Um, you know, that worked out in the 5,000 where the favorite wasn't even – wasn't anywhere close uh, in that race. So, yeah, I think the process is still fine. I think I would like to add some analytics to it at some point, maybe next year for the World Championships. Talk to John Sheeran about that. And then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, but it was a lot of fun. Are we adding any uh, Winter Olympics this coming year? Are you going to start uh, pumping out some, like, speed skating or something like that now? That would be fun. I am less into the Winter Olympics uh, just as a fan. So So we'll see. Yeah. But I mean, wait, that's next year, right? So next, yeah, we I think should definitely have some fun with that. I think it's 2022, so it should be this winter, unless I'm totally off. 2022, that would be next winter. Oh, oh so that no, that would be January of. Yeah, it starts on February right. 4th of this year. So right after, or right like during Super Bowl week, okay, or That'll between then. So we're gonna yeah. have Winter Olympics, Super Bowl. Daytona 500, obviously on the exact yeah. same level of those two things for me. Um, so that's going to be a fun little sprint there. And, well, and that is yeah. kind of the time that I was thinking about starting to talk about NFL draft bets as well. Okay. Because that's the kind of time where, you know, those markets start coming out and that's the time to jump on them, especially yep. for those first, the, the, the top picks as well. So yeah, it's good to know that we have a, a wide range of betting options to, to talk about on the show. We won't be bored, and that is that is for sure. We're not going to be bored right now because we have college football coming just around the corner. We're going to set for that by talking to Drew Martin. Follow him on Twitter at Drew Martin Bets. Check him out on Wager Talk and Sports Grid as well. Getting his thoughts on the college football futures market, who is in contention to win the national championship, who realistically could do so for this year, and much more. But first, hey, sports fans. FanDuel is offering an exclusive promotion for new sportsbook users. Join FanDuel Sportsbook today and make your first bet. If you lose, 
will give you a refund up to $1,000 or $1,000 in site credit within 72 hours. Your first bet after depositing will qualify. If you have multiple selections on one bet slip, it will be the first selection you made. Head over to the FanDuel Sportsbook today and place your first bet. Must be 21 plus and present Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. New users only. Max refund, $1,000 site credit. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line 1-800-889-979. Or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Covering the present. Let's bring Drew Martin back into covering the spread once again. This time talk some college football futures. Drew, it's been a minute. How are you doing today? Jim, I'm doing good, man. It's uh, I guess since the pandemic happened, it, it's been a good road since. You know, been down in Mexico for a while here in Las Vegas now, planning on spending uh, most of the football season in the state of Florida. So just trying to uh, chase the sunshine and find some winners. And always good to be on with you and Ed. Two of my favorites in this industry. So thanks for having me, guys. You're going to be in Vegas and Florida in the hottest parts of the summer. Uh, and you were in Mexico before. I feel like you might have this backwards. Wait, wait, why? Wait, you got to say why backwards, though. What do you mean? I sweat way like too to much to live that lifestyle, man. Oh, I see what you're saying. We, I, I mean, I got to I gotta put it in context. I grew up in South Florida, so I am okay. used to the heat. I Actually, Jim, I moved to... Uh, to Alabama, to Auburn, Alabama, and then to Atlanta, Georgia for my college and post-college years. I thought that was a little bit too cold. So I am a, <laughs> I will take a Vegas 110 day summer day over the December, you know, 50 and cold and rainy 10 out of 10 times. I'd love to visit cold gym, but in terms of where I want to live, I'll take the Vegas or the South Florida heat any day. So you take that. I'll take Alaska during the summer and then like Nashville during the winter. I think that then I'm probably cooking. That's like, that's my wheelhouse. We're about 50 degrees or so off in our calibration here. But, you know, hey, whatever works for you. Where were you in Mexico when you were down there? Uh, Veracruz, Mexico, which is uh, southeast of uh, Mexico City uh, on the coast town, their biggest port. It was a uh, it was a great experience down there at uh, my, my girlfriend's family's house and uh, just being able to to kind of see how they live down there, bet some sports, Mexican baseball as well, and actually uh, found a dog that was uh, near death and and did one of the greatest things I'm actually proud of in my life uh, in terms of saving her. And she's actually right here in my hotel room. Uh, in Las Vegas. So uh, she's now an American dog and, and doing well. So uh, that, that was kind of the backstory behind why I was in Mexico so long. That's awesome. Cool. Good for yeah. you. This is this yeah. sounds like a productive couple of months for Drew Martin. This is awesome. Yeah, thank you. You know, doing some good things. I figure it will bring hopefully good karma. You know, whatever's out there. I've, I've been trying to bet more underdogs in baseball, which favorites <laughs> have been covering, unfortunately. But now that she's in the United States, I feel right. like that might change. I'm looking for some plus price underdogs on the diamond. I love it. Well, let's uh, transfer that good karma now to college football and talk about the futures market there. And Drew, with so many teams, so much turnover year to year, it's tough, man, to try to identify and catch up in terms of researching college football heading into the upcoming year. And I want to talk to you about your process in terms of trying to identify what numbers matter, any shortcuts, what research, uh, what resources you rely upon. What are you doing to try to streamline your offseason research when it comes to college football? Um, it's a great question because actually things have changed in the last two years, Jim, at least for me personally, in terms of how I'm wagering on the sport. This is my favorite sport to kind of dig into as a fan. In terms of a sports better, it's good. Um, I wouldn't say it's as good as college basketball, just because I think the sports better has a little bit more advantage in college basketball. But I put it right there with it, Jim. You know, the amount of teams, the amount of information that odds makers have to dig into in order to put out a sharper number is just a lot of work. And so coming into college football, I think especially in the beginning of the year, I've gone back over, you know, multiple years now. It seems like weeks two through about weeks eight or nine is where I do my best. And then it kind of trails off there at the end because there's more opinion out there, more uh, more numbers to make uh, the lines for all of these teams. So that's kind of how I go at college football, really heavy in those weeks. And in terms of futures or season win totals, 
given the pandemic and you know, you always got to keep in mind if they're not playing the games, most times that's going to kind of void the bet. So therefore, you know, you, right. you're giving up your money for the full season. And if you get it right, you're not getting, you know, the, the winning portion of it back. So that's why I pump the brakes a little bit in terms of futures. But, um, you know, I, I'm still digging away. And uh, sure enough, I'm going to fire away on a couple here. So, uh, yeah, we can get into that for sure. Uh, be, before we get into that, Drew, I did want to ask you, like, how do you evaluate like a team like Connecticut that didn't even play last year? Like, it, yeah. does that make it impossibly hard? Are you just waiting for a couple games on them, or do you go by what happened in 2019? You know, it's a Old great Dominion. question. It's a great, it's a great question, Ed. And actually, I, I think with Jim's question, I left out a little bit in terms of just where I get my information from. You know, I do look at the different, you, you know, like Phil Steele, I think is great, but a, a lot of that is already factored into the market. I like to to kind of go down and break down the the beat writers. You know, the guys that are following these teams around know the roster, know what's going on better than really anybody out there. So when you're getting their opinion, kind of firsthand opinion, that's the that's the stuff that I think can can give you an edge in the market. So that's what I try to do. Just a lot of reading, a lot of researching the local newspapers, the local beat writers. And then, Ed, to your question, you know, with UConn, um, first off, you know, I put, kind of put UConn in the bucket of you know, the Huskies, um, ULM, UMass, where these, these teams are pretty low on the totem pole. You know, you got to know what you're kind of betting when you're getting in there. These backup linebackers, they're not exactly like top, top high school recruits here. You know, these guys are just yeah. kind of getting out there on the field, you know, um, and, and you just got to know what you're looking to bet. So be careful, kind of tread lightly in that. Really know your stuff when you're going into those teams, Ed, is how, how I would put it. And in terms of specifically towards UConn, I can't see that as a bet on opportunity, not playing football for a full year here. Like, especially with given the ability for college kids now to be able to transfer when they heard they weren't going to play. How many of those kids that are really good football players stayed on a roster right. like UConn? I don't know, Ed. So I would use that as a negative. Yeah. Kind of off that same point, with a lot of teams, specifically like the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, we have smaller samples from last year. And football right. is a small sample game to begin with. So, I mean, the good thing is it's conference games, generally, you know, tougher opponents and stuff like that. But does that worry you at all, too, trying to identify, you know, you know just because like the, the already small samples got even smaller for a lot of teams last year? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I'm a, I would me personally and how I'm going at this, Jim, I actually want to use that like 180 degree angle the other way. Maybe look for teams that really struggled last year, like maybe the Cal Golden Bears and, and look to bet on them this upcoming year, like not putting too, too much into last season, especially remember that the preseason last year was terrible. And Cal went into that first game. I think it was like a 10 a.m. Pacific kick. And then they lost that one. And it kind of steamrolled on them. So maybe a team like that looking to bet on. Um, but yeah, about last year, bringing it into this year. I don't know. I don't know that I would put too much into it, especially because we're likely going to get more more fans in the in the stadium. So home field advantage likely to be more. But at the same time, with the Delta variant going on, that could change as well. So it's just changes going on. And I'm actually putting less into last season's results than probably a lot of people out there. So let's talk about the markets, because you talked about win totals and how there's a lot of like downside, I guess, or a lot of potential for opportunity costs in betting win totals. Do you avoid win totals altogether? And which markets do you like most from futures perspective? Which ones do you find you yourself have the biggest edge traditionally? Well, I, you know, I never like to, the, to point people off of, you know, what what's exciting for them to bet. You know, if right. you're heading out and with some friends and you're wanting to put a wager on your favorite team to win the national championship, have at it. I'm not going to tell you not to do that, Jim. But if you're looking to do this to make money long term, you, you always want to look towards, you know, the vigorous, how much you're being charged to make these bets. And the smarter bet, in my opinion, and really, I would tell you the numbers are telling you this it costs more to make the futures bets, you know, where there's plus and then the numbers next to it. And only one team is likely going to win that bet. I tend to stay away from those type of bets, Jim. And I'm more towards, I, I gravitate more towards 
uh, season win total bets, where it's still the minus 110 model. It's like you're betting week one, like you're betting week two, both sides and totals, where you're having to risk $110 to win 100. They're only charging you that much to make the bet. So when you make a season win total bet on team A over eight wins and they get nine wins, you get paid appropriately. And when you lose it, you're only losing the 110 on the $100 bet. So I would point people towards season win totals over um, over the futures type bets. But Drew, I mean, part of the reason that you are getting better prices at win totals is probably because it's a sharper market, right? Books feel a little bit more confident in that as well. And then they feel less confident in the futures market, right? So, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying, but you know, how do you balance that, right? I mean, you know, if there's something that you really like in the futures market and you know that it's a little bit weaker, obviously it just kind of depends on the situation, I would guess. Yeah, uh, sure. I I guess there would be times um, and there has been in the past. Uh, I haven't really been the type to take advantage of that, unfortunately, and get those huge scores for a national champion that's kind of like off the radar, not the Alabamas or Georgias of the world. If you're going to tie up that money for that long, I'd want to get a little bit more uh, return on my investment. But um, yeah, sure. There's guys out there that probably do that, Ed. Um, Unfortunately, like I haven't, um, I I, I guess, made a huge success in doing that and tying up, um, I guess, a big portion of my bankroll for that long. I think the tougher part about trying to bet a long shot is that a lot of teams are long shots for a reason and don't have the upside Mm -hmm. to win a national championship. And that's a tough thing for me when I'm, you know, betting NASCAR and betting other things is trying to judge upside and say, okay, I don't want to write off a team because they haven't done it, but I also want to make sure they have the requisite upside to actually claim that national championship, win two playoff games, which is a very tough thing to do. So, Drew, for you, what process do you use to determine, quote unquote, upside? You know, which schools actually have the ability to have a season where they can, whether it be win a national championship or win a tougher conference and stuff like that? Sure. I mean, in terms of getting the upside, you know, you, you want to look for teams that might be riding under the radar a little bit, not getting the, 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 the huge national you, you know, headlines as much. And a team that has a path to get there that maybe the majority of people aren't looking at. Plus, you got to keep in mind, Jim, recruiting is so huge in college football. So you want to look back at, hey, what does this roster look like? how much talent is there top to bottom? If they have injuries, can they kind of overcome them with the guys stepping in? So if you're looking to take a shot at a national champion, um, one that I kind of circled here would be a team that, you know, has that recruiting advantage. And the question marks are going to be there or else they would be the Alabamas and the Georgias of the world. But you also want a good coach as well. So, uh, I I guess look off the beaten path in terms of teams that might be surprising to the upside and have the talent and uh, heck just fire away on one of them. So basically you judge talent or upside based on the talent of the individual players and the, and the coaching stats. Is that, that the correct takeaway there? Yeah, I would go to recruiting rankings. I would go towards the coaching staff. Yes, Jim. And then if you want to dig even deeper, I would go go towards, you know, the offensive and defensive lines and really kind of concentrate there. You know, we can go back to the, I guess, in American football, the the last uh, competitive American football game played, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Tampa Bay Bucks in the Super Bowl. And if you remember going back into that, it was Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, everybody talking about that. And then very early on, you know, uh, about before halftime, it became very evident that there was a mismatch in the Chiefs offensive line and the Bucks defensive line. There was an advantage one way towards the defense and it absolutely affected the game. So if you can read the trenches, um, I think you're ahead of the eight ball a little bit. So you always want to like look at how good each offensive and defensive line is at the right behind quarterback. Those two need to be very far up there, Jim. Yeah. So we do have a, I know you told us not to bet the futures market, but we do have them over at the Sportsbook. Sportsbook. Um, maybe, maybe a team that, that you think might has an outside chance. And, and yeah, I mean, I, again, and I, I want to fire away on the national championship if, uh, if you're looking at it. And look at uh, FanDuel Sportsbook here, plus 4,000 on the Texas A&M Aggies. And, Ed, I'm going at this one because – Obviously, the upside's there, you know, plus 4,000. You're looking at Alabama at plus 250. Those are almost two drastically different bets here. We're getting a a lot more kickback 
Now, granted, we're taking on more risk here. Texas A&M, uh, in terms of national champions, at least that's relevant to the conversation. There isn't any in Alabama with a bunch. So we're up against it that way. But when you look at their kind of path to get there, Ed, if they're able to get to the playoffs, coming out of the SEC West, I'm, I'm liking this plus 4,000 ticket a lot. And looking down at their schedule, you look at their out-of-conference, Kent State, Colorado, New Mexico – um, likely going to be 3-0 and heading into SEC play. They also have Prairie View A&M later in the season. So those are four wins I'm marking off in my schedule. They start off with Arkansas. I like Texas A&M against Arkansas here, Ed. And then looking down the schedule, sure, even if they, they drop one to Alabama, right, I think that there's still a path for an 11-1 and SEC team to make the playoffs. So I'm using that in my back pocket, even though the Alabama game – is at home for Texas A&M. So watch out there. They get a bye before Auburn. They do have at Mississippi. Look, we're taking a shot here at a plus 4,000 um, uh, ticket here. So we're taking on some risk at LSU as well. We're going to need these games that are definitely toss-ups. But um, overall, I think Texas A&M at plus 4,000. We get the coaching staff here. We get the recruiting as well. Um, I think there is a path here to uh, take a shot at a big uh, plus price with the Aggies. I like the schedule analysis there, too, and determining the path like you alluded to before. Now, let's talk about the conference championship markets, the divisional markets as well. Any teams you believe are undervalued in those markets with where things currently stand? Um, well, and actually, I wanted to to talk about this, Jim, in terms of you look at Texas A&M plus 1,200 to win the SEC and then plus 4,000 to win the national championship. I like that discrepancy from yeah. plus 1,200 yeah. to plus 4,000, because if they win the SEC at plus 12, 1,200, you're going to even like this plus 4,000 even more. So I like that ticket there um, in, in analysis towards that. But um, in, in terms of taking a futures stab here at the conference, I would look towards the Big 12, actually, and a couple teams that I would point towards. One being West Virginia, you know, Neil Brown, the head coach for West Virginia. First off, we get plus 2,500. So risk, risk 100 and you win 2,500 on the kickback with West Virginia. A couple things I wanted to point out here. Neil Brown, if you followed him in the Sun Belt, he was great for Troy. He built this program. I like what he's doing. He's getting multiple years here of recruiting at West Virginia. And whenever you're taking a shot in conference, you want to make sure to kind of get a team, you know, with that big plus price. And also, they don't have to climb over too many teams in the Big 12. And, of course, Oklahoma has ran through the Big 12, and it's showing in their price here. You're having to lay a price for the big for uh, Oklahoma to win the Big 12. And I think West Virginia, you know, this isn't a, a, a ticket I really love. I'm not betting a lot personally on it. But the fact that they play, and, and people know this in the market, you know, it is a tough travel for the opponent. Now, it could be a tough travel for West Virginia on the other side playing the away games. But if they get good quarterback play here, I think that the recruiting has taken a notch up. I think they get the coaching as well. And heck, a puncher's chance here at the Oklahoma Sooners and plus 2,500. Again, they're going to have to kind of knock off Texas as well. Oklahoma State's pretty good. TCU and Gary Patterson, never going to count them out. But at the big plus price of plus 2,500, I think uh, WV WVU is uh, worth a look in conference futures. Awesome. So, Drew, let's go to uh, the markets you like best, win totals. FanDuel has uh, win totals posted for almost every team. Is there anything that you're liking there? Yeah, so this is one. And actually, I need to give a shout out to uh, a guy that we've uh, run with a couple times, Ed Fang. And uh, actually, he's done some work with uh, FanDuel, Ed, Gabe Morenci. He's a guy that pointed me towards this one, guys. Uh, very entertaining guy. And actually, he's had some success with uh uh, futures tickets, the Miami hurricanes. Okay. They're, they're getting a lot of pub here. They got the quarterback, the offensive coordinator combo here. It kind of sets up well with the mobile quarterback. And, um, of course, Rhett Lashley is their offensive coordinator, a, uh, disciple of Gus Malzahn. And it's kind of translated well to performing well. Manny Diaz in his third year, that's kind of a circle bet on Miami has recruited. Well, the, the only problem I see with the hurricanes and their season win total at nine and a half at FanDuel is when you look at this schedule, it's pretty tough. And let's let's kind of remind everybody, the ACC, the middle of the pack is really good. I actually think it's underrated looking at the ACC. You know, everybody knows about Clemson. 
and they're going to put in a new quarterback here. We'll see what happens with that. But outside of Clemson, I think people kind of just wash over the ACC. But really, it's a quality a quality conference, and I don't think there's a lot of wins that are just check mark up. Oh, that's a win here. So Miami also starts off with Alabama in Atlanta. I'm counting that as a loss. Now, if they knock off Alabama, watch out here. The Miami Hurricanes might have a shot at the national championship, and this ticket might be in trouble. But I don't think they're knocking off the Crimson Tide here. Then they come home and play App State. App State's a tough team. I'm not counting that as a 100% win. But even if they win that, watch out. Michigan State as well. I think the Spartans are actually going to bounce back a little bit in the Big Ten. So that's three out of conference before we get to Central Connecticut that is likely a win here. So out of their four non-conference games, I don't know. What do you guys see that at? You know, three and one, maybe two and two. If it's two and two, we're looking real pretty going into the ACC games. I mean, they get Virginia short week at North Carolina. Watch out for that. You know, Sam Hall, Sam Hall and uh, UNC. NC State, I view that as a toss-up game. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's a tough team. That's on the road October 30th around Halloween. Another sharp angle, or I like to think it's sharp. Growing up in South Florida, looking at Miami Hurricanes um, kind of end of the season scheduling, guys, when they travel up north, watch out because such a big percentage of their roster is Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County recruits. And really, it, when they come into college football, a lot of these kids have not played in a in a football game under 50 degrees. I'm not making that up. So watch out for that later in the season. And sure enough, they're at Pitt. They're at Florida State and Tallahassee. That could be cold as well. And at Duke, we all know uh, the Duke Blue Devils, ATS, at times, well-coached team can be uh, not definitely a for-sure win. They got Virginia Tech, Georgia Tech as well. There's just a lot of teams coming up in the ACC. So nine and a half. The Miami Hurricanes are going to have to win double-digit games. Alabama out of, out of conference. I don't like that at all, guys. I think it's too high. I like the Miami Hurricanes under. If you can find you know an alt, an alt number under nine as well, I like that. So I'm under on the Miami Hurricanes. Yeah, and a very public team too. A team that people enjoy a lot. You're going to get some tough numbers on them if people want to be optimistic on them. Uh, minus 145 under nine and a half. So the alternate numbers there, definitely attractive as well. That is Drew Martin. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Drew Martin Betts and follow along as we get set for some college football. Once again, hopefully a less chaotic season of coming for the college football betting landscape. Drew, welcome back to the U.S. We appreciate it. Uh, hopefully everything with the dog goes well and everything with your bets goes well this fall too. Absolutely, Jim. Thanks for having me. And uh, Ed, th thanks as well. And best of luck to you guys this college football season. Let's get some winners, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Drew. Appreciate it. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Drew Martin for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on the college football futures market for this year. And Ed, I've been looking forward to the NFL for a long time, getting my stuff ready, trying to build out my win total projections and stuff like that. But college football is kind of sneaking up on me. But, you know, hearing Drew talk and and talking about it is getting me excited for this upcoming year when things should be less chaotic than they were last year. Or, or just we can return to the normal chaos. Of, right. of college football, not not the chaos in which games get canceled and postponed and, and so on and so forth. I am also looking forward to a college football season with out-of-conference games. That yes. was one of the big things that we were missing last year, and I'm both excited about those games and the fact that the lack of them don't mess up all my ranking methods and, and predictive methods. So, yeah, it should be good, and I think everyone's excited about it. So. Yeah, watching the games is secondary. It's more about getting the good data that we are concerned about here for sure. Let's move now into covering the future where we are both talking at Fallon and Ed. You're focusing on quarterbacks and mistakes that they make. You're talking about fumbles for today. So uh, yep. might we get some uh, Danny Dimes discussion going on here? So, Jim, let me ask you. So fumbles, uh, lost fumbles. So uh, what fraction of them do you think happen on runs versus after catches versus quarterback sacks? Quarterback sacks probably account for 70%. Of the total fumbles lost? If I had to guess. Well, that's a lot. So so the, the, the other 30 is... Uh, like after the catch, runs, stuff like that. Yeah. So it's not quite that high, okay. but it is significantly high. So over the last six years... 
uh, 31% of fumbles lost in the game of football in the NFL are on quarterback sacks. I was way off. <laughs> which, well, you were way off in kind of the other direction, right? Because right. sacks only happen on about 3.6% of offensive plays. That's true. And so that's what I found surprising. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess part of me has kind of known this for a while uh, based on some other people's work. Um, but I went back and ran the numbers and, you know, when, when you look at fumbles lost, you know, about 32.2% happen on running plays and that's only a little bit more than on sacks, which is 31.1%. But, um, you know, 41.3% of offensive plays over that time have been runs. So you get significantly higher, um, you get significantly higher sack rates on, on fumbles, right? So when you look over the six year sample, uh, quarterbacks fumbled on 13.4% of sacks uh, compared to uh, fumbles that happen about 1.6% of run plays. So those numbers are all fumbles. Um, you lose about 54% of fumbles on sacks uh, simply because these tend to be surprise strip sack kind of plays. And the, the, the offense is like, oh, what, what's going on? Defense has a slight edge because at least one guy knows that the ball is loose. Um, on running plays, the defense only recovers about 42.2% of fumbles. So you want to get an edge in betting. We're talking about quarterback fumbles. So maybe the stat is to look at how often quarterbacks fumble on these sack plays. And I've looked into this and I found that, you know, that wasn't really predictive. Uh, when you look at the year to year quarterback sack fumble rate, um, your R squared is pretty small and not anything that I'm very confident about um, using as a predictor. You know, it was kind of interesting because you did see some of your running athletic quarterbacks have lower sack rates. Uh, the Russell Wilson's, the Sean Watson's of the world. Uh, you did see some of the pocket passers have higher uh, fumble rates. But so instead, like, let's think about how else we can potentially use this. And I think kind of a, I mean, a not super precise, but a way that I'm thinking about and I'm going to be testing this upcoming season is to look at sack rates. And when you think about sack rates, you know, you often think about how important the offensive line is. Um, but one of the things that I've discovered is that the quarterback actually owns sack rates a lot more than uh, we often think. And so one example of this is when you look at um, the sack rate. So basically how often a quarterback gets sacked per drop back. Um, you know, the R squared year to year for that is about 24%. And that is competitive with things that we know are sticky from year to year, like completion percentage uh, at 25% and, and bad ball rate, which I talked about is, is actually about 28%. So sack rate is one of these stats that tends to be pretty sticky from year to year. Um, basically the decision-making process of the quarterback is pretty critically important in determining sacks. I'm not trying to say the offensive line doesn't matter because that's certainly not true, but you know, a lot of the evidence does suggest that, um, the quarterback's contribution to sacks is tends to be more sticky than, than even that offensive line contribution. So, so what can we do with that? Well, let's look at how we can use pass sack rate to predict the future. And I did some research, you know, the nice thing about the NFL is we can get bigger sample sizes on some of these guys. And my research shows us that about a five year average of sack rate is probably the best. not probably is the best predicting <laughs> forward for 2021. And, uh, you know, you get some you get some interesting names. So the quarterbacks that tend to get sacked the most that will play this year are Russell Wilson, 8.2 percent. And that's compared to an NFL average of 6.2 percent. Um, Tyrod Taylor's one uh, and 9.4 percent, uh, a guy that could be starting this upcoming season. And then, you know, then we got to talk about the guys that actually really do uh, a good job avoiding sacks, getting rid of the ball. And, uh, you know, one guy that comes up is Tom Brady. So he has uh, had a 3.9% sack rate over the last five years. And he was good in New England for the first four of those years. And then he kind of came into Tampa Bay. And there were a lot of question marks about whether uh, that offensive line could protect for him. Um, you know, the offensive line did okay last year. So when you look at PFF's pass block grade, they were 14th out of 32 teams right in the, the, the fat media mid, middle uh, average part of the NFL. But, you know, Brady only got sacked on 3.5% of his dropbacks last year. So that's kind of exhibit a of how quarterbacks definitely impact these sack rates. 
and uh, evidence about how, um, you know, that's something that we, I will be looking at to, to see if that impacts turnovers and see if something um, that can help my predictive models. And I think that you can also see this from looking in season when there have been quarterback changes. If you look at whatever year it was, Daniel Jones was a rookie. You look at the yeah. Giants sack with Eli Manning, a quarterback versus the sack yep. with Daniel Jones, a quarterback. It's like triple. <laughs> it's, yep. it's, a, it's a massive, massive difference. And that doesn't mean that Eli Manning was better. Obviously, there were other things Jones did well. But like, that's that. Also, Joe Flacco versus Lamar Jackson. The year that Lamar Jackson took over, it's the same thing. And y- y- it's not just you who has found this. Dr. Eric Eager has had a study yep. up on PFF seeing the same thing. I played offensive line in high school. I love offensive line. I will advocate for the importance of offensive line always. But if I can pass the blame to someone else, I'll take that too. So I I think that the evidence says that quarterbacks play a role in their sack rate. We've seen anecdotal evidence as well, not just looking at overall data as well. And it makes sense too. You know, you just think about different quarterbacks hold the balls, hold the ball longer, may have different awareness, stuff like that. It does matter a lot. And I, we can see guys improve in this area. Uh, you know, yeah. D- Deshaun Watson has been much better at avoiding sacks recently than he was in the past, but Russell Wilson has always had this issue, no matter how good the offensive line has been. So I think that looking at that in terms of just trying to find sticky metrics and sacks matter a lot in terms of predicting how an offense will perform. Sacks are massively detrimental to an offense. So I think that looking at it that way is as far as a few things. If we're trying to find numbers we can lean on and trying to be predictive this year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another example is uh, Drew Locke. So uh, not the greatest quarterback, but uh, actually had a really small, has had a really small sack rate since he uh, started at uh, with, with Denver. And it was a, it was a big difference between him and the backups that played for a couple games uh, Denver's uh, allowed sack rate was was pretty bad. The offensive line didn't really grade out that well. Um, but Drew Locke, for all his faults, didn't get sacked much. Funny you should mention Drew Locke, Ed, because my covering the future for this week is about those Denver Broncos. And I think that they've been an interesting team overall this year. Their futures market has been interesting. It's been bouncing around all over the place. They had some super short Super Bowl odds at one point due to the Aaron Rodgers buzz. And obviously that's not happening now, but I don't think sports books have adjusted enough to account for the fact that they're not going to get a a quarterback upgrade via someone like that. Maybe Teddy Bridgewater, but they have not changed quarterbacks. And I think that the under here in eight and a half wins is enticing at minus 115. Most of that is due to quarterback play because Drew Locke, despite the lack of fumbles, uh, lack of sacks, finished 36 in passing net expected points per drop back last year. That's out of 44 qualified quarterbacks. Teddy Bridgewater was 23rd, but that was with Joe Brady calling the shots. And Joe Brady, I think we've got enough data here to say he's pretty good at his job. I do have them projected to take a step forward this year in terms of passing efficiency because it's another year with Drew Locke. Teddy could be an improvement. They get Cortland Sutton back and stuff like that. But even the improved offense ranks 29th in projected passing efficiency based on what I've got here. And with that projection, they're at 6.9 wins. That's 1.6 lower than their mark of 8.5. If I want to get them to eight and a half wins, I would need to boost their projected passing efficiency to 0.113. That is in line with what Teddy Bridgewater did last year. And it's not an outrageous number. It'd be about league average. But I don't think league average should be the baseline assumption given the pieces they have in this offense. I think that 0.113 is about a 75th or 80th percentile outcome in terms of passing efficiency, more so than the median or mean projection in terms of their passing efficiency. So could Denver be really good this year? Yeah, they could. They've got a lot of pieces in place. That defense should be really solid. And they don't need superstar level quarterback play to get eight and a half wins. They need to be average in that department. But from a probability perspective, the most likely scenario to me is that they don't quite get there. They're a below average passing offense, and I don't think that's going to be enough to get them to be at eight and a half wins. So you put that in division with the Chiefs and the Chargers, who I do like quite a bit, and the Raiders team that I think is a little bit undervalued right now. I'm fully comfortable betting the Broncos under eight and a half wins at minus 115. I think the Drew Lock discussion is interesting here, Ed, because despite those good sack numbers, 
he still had really bad expected points numbers, which do account for sacks. Those are baked into that number as well yep. because everything else was so bad. So right. what are your thoughts on the Broncos here entering 2021? Well, I mean, I think I think you might have a rough time if they get to average pass offense because I think their pass defense could be really good. Sure. Uh, they, they had, um, you know, Vic Fangio is a defensive guy, had some really good performances from the cornerback uh, Bryce Callahan last year. Uh, drafted a high floor cornerback in Patrick Sertan this year. And uh, so I think that unit could be really good. So you get Von Miller back in the pass rush. Um, so, you know, I kind of expect a lot of pretty, some good things from their defense. Uh, I don't expect much from, from the pass offense. So, so we'll see about that. What do your numbers say about the defense? So I have them projected, uh, to rank 12th overall defensively and seventh against the pass. So that's with them being an above average unit. Um, because they did make some some improvements there, and they yeah. were already good to begin with. So I do expect them to be a good defense, but even with that, because you know I view passing offense being more predictable, therefore it gets more yeah. weight in my projected win totals. Yeah, that's should. the reason why I do skew towards the under and view them still negatively, despite the fact that I do think that defense, I agree with you, could be really good this year. Yeah, no, and, and you definitely should weight the offense because it is more predictive. <laughs> Preseason, in season, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just, in in a league of unstable statistics, uh, pass yeah. offense is is the one thing that we can lean on a little bit. And I would not mind if they were good because I previously have had like man crushes on Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater, so uh, <laughs> it, just not good enough to get to nine wins. If they could avoid that, you know, play well, get me eight wins, and cash out. We'll be good there for sure. That is all the time that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Drew Martin for swinging by and breaking down his college football futures thoughts. Find him on Twitter at Drew Martin Betts and check him out on Wager Talk and Sports Grid as well. Make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, you name it. You can find us there. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review as well. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, so I'm writing my email newsletter, uh, sports betting, uh, based on analytics and, and all my research. Uh, I'm striving to be valuable, concise, and, and entertaining in that service. So check that out at thepowerrank.com. Uh, what I talked about with the the hidden importance of, of quarterbacks today was was part of that. And you can check that out over on my blog at thepowerrank.com. And then also I had Aaron Schatz on a Football Outsiders on the Football Analytics Show, my podcast. So awesome conversation, definitely worth checking out. And and uh, yeah, lots of other things going on as well. Yeah, we had Aaron Schatz on this podcast last year. Really fun to talk to him and uh, all the knowledge that he has stored up there from years upon years of uh, covering the NFL from an analytics perspective. So check that out on the Football Analytics Show and check out the quarterback numbers over at the Power Rank. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for chopping up the clips for the FanDuel uh, Twitter account for this week. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you with your bets, whether it be NFL preseason, college football futures, or whatever else may be. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.